I would say good morning to all, but I have no idea what time it is where everyone is. So we're just going to wish you a really good day and keep this as vague as possible when it comes to time zones. I know that some of you are early. It is quite early for some of you and probably just in the middle of the day for other ones of you. So welcome you all. Um, I'm going to share my screen and the way we're going to do this really, it's going to be very conversational, right? Uh, I think the last thing that I wanted to do is to go through a ton of slides, have more screen time and a structure that's a little rigid. So I really do encourage you guys to like ask questions. We're going to have one pause in the middle of the presentation, but if you guys feel like interrupting before, don't hesitate. Let's keep this very conversational. Um, let me share my screen and we're going to get started. And let me know if everyone can see my screen. Yes, wonderful. So first of all, thank you to LA for making this happen. I know it has not been easy uh, middle of the pandemic for all of us. But when you think about it, that is the one thing that has uh, unified us as human beings throughout all of this. There's one commonality that we are all living and it's like what's happening right now in the pandemic. What that has created is one narrative for all of us across different continents and in different countries, which is something that's very rare, I think, in a lifetime to be able to have that commonality that, go, that goes across globally. The emotional narrative of healthcare advertising sounds a bit like a mouthful, but it's an important one. Um, I think we've all seen a lot of emotion put into a type of advertising that could be overly simplistic, right? There's emotion in bubble gum when we sell bubble gum, and you wonder, like, wow, what, what, wow, how did they manage to like put so much emotion into the cherry flavor bubble gum? Um, and healthcare hasn't really cracked that yet. I have to say though, that in the past, I would say maybe six years or so, the healthcare space in advertising has changed. And one of the things that has made that change is the inclusion of this category in certain renowned award shows, uh, which has pushed the creative significantly Right in the, if you look at the creative that has been done in the past five years to today, uh, there's been a significant push on what healthcare is and who healthcare is for. So I'm going to walk you guys through a series of thought that I have on how do we approach this narrative that exists in healthcare advertising, especially in a way that we generate it as creatives. And that's where it gets really, really interesting, right? the ownership that we have to be able to tell a story and the ability that exists that we have to be able to create a story and how we can shape that, right? So there's one question that I have, right? Based on what I just told you guys, let's say we have advertising a painkiller drug, right? Something that common, right? Nothing crazy. I'm not talking about an oncology brand at this point. Can a pink killer be as emotional as a hot sauce? Crazy, crazy thought, right? I figure, throw it, I'll throw it there and, and, and let's see where this takes us, right? You might say, you know, this guy's nuts so comparing a painkiller with hot sauce. Not really, right? The problems that need to be solved in, in advertising are the same no matter what the category is, right? The solutions have to be rooted in a creative solution, not not um, diminish by the obstacles that exist in healthcare. That's where an opportunity lies, right? In this series of restrictions that exist. Now, what is the healthcare advertising space, right? If I were to ask you guys, what is that? And some of you have started your careers in that space. Some of you have no idea what this is. And to be perfectly honest, there's not a lot of creatives that go to design school, advertising school, thinking, ooh, I want to do healthcare advertising. A lot of us like fall into this because the challenges are pretty big, pretty substantial, and every single project is one that has never been approached before. When you think about 
a new drug that's coming into the market as an example. It's never been there before. There's a new study that has shaped this drug that we need to be able to communicate in a simplified way that takes into account A, B, C, D, E, and that's where we need to crack that creative solution. That is where that opportunity lies and where that opportunity exists. That is what keeps the space quite interesting. It's also a space where it's easy just to give up, where you just say, wow, man, there's so many restrictions. We're just going to do what we're told, we're just going to do what's going to fly. And that is the biggest danger that exists, right? In, I would say, in healthcare and in any other brand, right? Where the challenge stops. There's something that I like to refer as creative stamina. I think creative stamina is something that we all need to have as creatives to be able to continue to push those, those boundaries. And those who have them is defined as eight out of 10 times you hear a no, two out of 10 times you hear a yes, right? It, it, it seems like a crazy space to be able to be in and hear a lot of no's and by believing for those two yes that happen once in a while, but the payoff is wonderful, right? And the implications of that yes and the changes that exist potentially in behavior are also very important. So that's a little bit of like what the healthcare space is, right? Medical, regulated and conventional. I'm sure you guys are pretty much aware that this is the biggest restrictions that exist in healthcare advertising. Medical, of course, we have to communicate something that's based on science, right? It doesn't matter how we spin it. It comes from a truth, a scientific truth that is regulated, regulated by internal bodies within the, the, the companies or even external bodies that kind of like tell you what you can say and what you cannot say. A good thing because you can't be just like promoting things like saying whatever you want. It's a type of restriction that also exists in the consumer world, right? But it's a lot tighter and a lot more um, strict, I would say, in, in, in healthcare advertising. Unconventional. What do I mean by conventional? If I go back at what I was saying before, what this creative stamina is and what is it that's needed for us to continue to push, the conventional is where we end up. Right when we kind of like just say, "Well, and this is like this is never going to fly." That's where the conventional lives. That's where we end up with the golden retriever running on the beach, which you all you have all seen in some type of healthcare advertising. When you say, "Oh, we're going to show healthy people," there's the healthy person doing an activity. They're running, interacting with a golden retriever, right? I'm over simplifying this, this, this vision, trust me, but you know, I think it, it, it encapsulates um, more or less like that very conventional approach to healthcare advertising. Um, this is an interesting statement. It doesn't matter how functional it is, there's always an emotion attached to it. There is no function without emotion. There's emotion without function, but no function without emotion. And that's something interesting, right? When you think about it, what does that exactly mean? Where is this going to take me? This is where the challenge really starts. This is where it starts to get very interesting. This is where you get your brief from the client, usually very functional, right? We need to get from A to B, and this is what we have, and this is what it does, right? Okay, so what do we do with that? How do we generate tension? This is where I love to live. This is like that space of function and emotion where it really creates friction and tension to be able to get to that nugget that's going to allow us to have something that's disruptive and unexpected in a very regulated space, right? It is possible. It's absolutely possible, especially when you start doing thinking this way. That tension becomes essential to find it, to dig it. Not easy to get to, really not easy to get to. And a lot of the times it's good to include the client in this as well to have those discussions. Clients go from medical regulators, legal, marketers, they don't all sing the same song. 
they all want to get to a really amazing place in very different ways. And this is where we come in, right, as communicators, as creatives, to be able to listen to everything that they have to say and to be able to give it back to them in a way that's unexpected. One of the things that I found out across my career is that the more you ask, the more you listen, the easier your job gets. Most of the time on the client side, they have all the answers. You sit there, you listen, they tell you absolutely everything. They just they didn't know what to do with it. And then you take it, you flip it, you generate tension, and suddenly you serve it back in a way that they have never thought about it before. But when you think about it and when you back a little bit of how you got there, most of it really came from them. They are the experts at this. We're not. We're the experts at communicating what you're trying to put out there. And that's our responsibility and our expertise as well. So no function without emotion. Something is very important to think about it. All right. When you think about it that way, you start at a really good place to be able to create tension and any type of disruptive type of communication in healthcare. Now, if I continue, I, don't know, I think my computer rose. Oh, here we go. Oop. Sorry, guys. All right. If you breathe, you are who we are talking to. Uh, this is probably my favorite part and the most important part of working in healthcare. So yes, there's regulations. Yes, there's a lot of no's, but think about it. Healthcare is so vast and so big that who we're talking to is whoever is breathing. It's not somebody who likes a certain car with a certain job with a certain amount of kids. Yeah, of course, those are all subsections in, in, in healthcare, but think about it. What we're trying to achieve with healthcare and to get to people with a narrative that actually relatable to them is an absolutely amazing opportunity when we talk about who we're talking to and who our target is. It's big. It's big. We all need this healthcare. We don't all need a pack of cherry gum, right? But we all do need this, right? And it's health is something that is with us every day. We, we need a reminder once in a while how important that is, right? And I think this pandemic I kind of like uh, reminded us uh, in, in quite in a brutal way of how important health is and how important it is to own that and be responsible of it. And also like how just made us very curious, right? So, so think about it in a, in a way of the possibilities that go with a small project in healthcare and how big that could become, you know? I'm not talking about creating any types of complexity where people are going to get detached. I'm not talking about creating any type of narrative that comes from big pharma so that people clean out. I'm talking about talking to the person that is next to you, in front of you, across of you, in a way that they can actually really, really listen because you're relating to them. The only way to be relevant, there's one way to be relevant. There's no two, there's no three, there's just one. And I really, really believe this, especially in this case, when we're trying to shape up narratives that are highly emotional in the healthcare space. And that way is really to do one thing, and that is to listen. That's it. That's the only way to be relevant. We cannot assume that what we do is relevant if we haven't been listening to what's happening in front of us. I just want to stop here for a couple of minutes because I do want to keep this talk also very relevant to all of us. And I do want to listen to you guys if you guys have any questions or any comments so far on what I've uh, or what I put forward at this point.
I really liked what you said about listening to clients and that they give you all the answers and then you just put it all together in a way that that's where the creative aspect comes in where they don't know how to put it together. So they give you what they need, but then you give them what they need in return that they maybe didn't even know they needed. <laughs> it's true. You know, I often say that clients don't know what they want until they see it, right? But you need to be able to put those things in front of them for them to say, wow, that's most of the time they go, yeah, I was thinking about that, <laughs> right? Of course you were, you know, but there's a limit in, and the limit, the limit that they have also comes because of the type of work and environment that you live in, right? Their concerns are very different, right? Our concerns are very different, but the knowledge that they have is absolutely precious for us to be able to move things forward. Anyone else have any comments or questions? Yeah. Uh, hello. Hi, Marty. Hi. Um, what are, what what's like that collaboration process like with like between the the creatives and um, the client? Yeah. Okay. That's 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 a great question, right? And the easy answer is it depends on the client. But when it depends on, it, when you put the creative in the driver's seat, right? That collaboration, th this is how I like to refer to it, right? Get, get this like a, as a little bit of a, an idea. We, in creative, we work in the kitchen, right? We chop the carrots and we serve a beautiful plate to the client. The collaboration aspects, when you let the client into the kitchen, right? Once you let them into the kitchen, then they're into conversations that are, for the most part, uncomfortable with, but when we lessen, their comfort becomes absolutely precious. That collaboration looks like you could have somebody in marketing at the same table as somebody in legal, as, as somebody in medical, having one conversation, not three conversations, right? Not the legal conversation, not the medical conversation, not the creative conversation, one conversation. When you're able to generate that space and put everyone together to talk about the same thing, what you have is one conversations with different point of views. And that becomes a tremendous space to be able to collaborate. So that's what it looks like, right? And you add a strategist to that, which are the people that make the most sense in my life. Like it becomes an absolutely incredible offer. And what that generates is unexpected, unconventional, disruptive, and aligned with all the concerns and addresses all the concerns that these different stakeholders had to put forward. Hmm. Sounds very interesting. Having like all those different conversations happening or rather the different types of people having the same conversation, yeah. Absolutely, and it's a, it's a challenge because yeah, if you take uh, the day-to-day -day, people are really you know walking around with blinders and doing what they have to do and answering yeah. the emails that they have to do and so when you pull them out what i found like it's like nine out of ten times it is so appreciated and they are so grateful that we have generated and created that space for them to have those conversations it's it's incredible right for them it becomes like a place of like wow first of all i'm not dealing with my day-to-day -day, so my mind is in a completely different space. My contribution is extremely relevant and my concerns are still real, but there's a space that has been created that did not exist in my day to day. It, it's incredible what happens. It really is. It takes a lot of discipline, right? To be able to create that, not only from our side, but also from the client. And also it takes a lot of commitment to be able to make that happen as well. But I mean, Sorry, go ahead. Oh no, I was just gonna add in and say I would imagine you probably would be able to get a more to a more wholesome like place with the idea when you include like the medics, rather the, the researchers and the and the legal guys and all that. Absolutely. And and you also get a very different type of understanding from those like different segments that are contributing to the brand or the mm -hmm. message because if you if you think about somebody who is in uh, science and regulations, right? They're just trying to make sure that everything that you say is accurate with the science and you're gonna be allowed to do it. They don't understand or they're not exposed to the fact that that science needs to be communicated in a way that's appealing 
to somebody else because we're not talking to them anymore, right? We're talking to somebody else now. So that shift, how do you do it? And that is with this like emotional narrative becomes very handy. An emotional narrative is not something that disregards the truths of science, the truths of regulation, but what it does, it takes into account the human truth that exists to be able to push things forward. Cool. All right, so we will we'll continue and we'll have a, another chance to chat uh, towards the end as well. Um, but there's something that I want to really continue to hammer on because um, I do find it very, very important. And that is like relevant means relatable, right? We, when you talk about that emotional story, right, that we're trying to shape up that emotional narrative in a um, healthcare space, and you've done the listening, you're able to become relevant because you're answering something that somebody has been telling you. And when you understand what they're feeling versus not only what they're telling you, but what they are feeling, then you can actually relate to them. When you're able to relate to them, the story that you're going to be crafting in your piece of communication becomes extremely powerful. It becomes very impactful and it becomes incredibly relatable. And then you're actually building something that as a creative comes from you and you feel it inside of you that is right and that you are addressing what this person is feeling. It's no longer a mechanical process, right? To be able to get to this creative. For me, it becomes an emotional process. I mean, well, you guys as creatives, you all know that no creative can hide, right? We do what we do, we put it in front. Sometimes it gets shredded, sometimes it gets embraced, but our work is emotional. When you take that emotional, right, that commitment that we have to a piece of communication to put forward, and you apply the listening and the relevancy to be relatable, it becomes extremely powerful. There's one thing, there's a video that I wanna show you guys of a project that I worked on a couple of years ago. We were doing a campaign on uh, a vaccine for meningitis. One of the things that we did was to cast, obviously we were casting mothers, right? Of uh, survivors of meningitis. And that part for me was not only about casting the right person, but doing a lot of listening about what we need to put forward. I'm gonna show you a video that really, it's still with me of something. This is something that I think I'm gonna carry with me in my whole career because what came out of that um, casting session was very unexpected. And it became unexpected because we created the space to listen all the way to the last minute when you get to casting, right? So what that did, it continued to shape the campaign, right? Even we were almost at production at this point. But it was super important. I'm going to play it for you guys, and then we could probably talk about it a little bit. They kept telling me that this was going to die. I'm sorry. They kept telling me that to say goodbye to her. No one told me that I could have had her vaccinated from six weeks. I didn't know. That was not expected in a casting call. Right? Casting, you try to say, you know, can this person talk on the camera? How do they look on camera? And they're able to tell their story, you know? And we asked her, so tell us your story. And her story was extremely powerful. I remember that day we were all in the casting room and we all like, we were very quiet. We were breathing this thin and we honestly didn't even know what to say because suddenly it became what we were doing was going to impact somebody who has lived something incredibly emotional and difficult. This is for me, one of the best examples of how what we do for living in healthcare has a tremendous impact on humans, first of all. Her story 
she's talking about her daughter, right? She didn't know that there was a vaccination. And the whole, the, the story is a little bigger than that because she was, uh, I believe she was in Thailand on vacation and her daughter had a high fever. And then that turned very quickly and she was in the middle of the street trying to get an ambulance and so on and so forth. And nobody knew what was going on until she got to the hospital. And they say it's meningitis and, you know, she had no idea that there was a vaccine for it. So there's all the guilt as a parent that comes in. How come I didn't know this? And now I got to deal with this. And my, 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 my little daughter is suffering. So, so much. it's a very, very heavy, very heavy story. Um, and then there's a level of authenticity in this that you don't want to lose. You don't want to take this and flip it into big pharma is telling you what to do. You don't want to, you don't want to get there. You want to keep this authenticity and this humanity and this feeling that we all have looking at this. You want to keep it alive, not turn it into guilt, but turning into a motivator to do something, right? Not easy to do all the time. Um, difficult, but real. It's so real that it, it's hard to forget, right? Now, understanding the reality allows for emotion. This was a way, it was a slap in the face on how we can understand reality, right? To be able to generate emotion. Extremely important, right? It goes back to the listening that I was talking about. Our reality is not their reality. Our day-to-day -day in an agency, doing the grind and like getting stuff done and checking the boxes and answering emails and getting all calls, it's not the reality. It is important for us as creative to pause at one point and to say, well, okay, let me get into this. Let me breathe it in and let me try to figure out what is the reality? How can I understand it? Then you get into this space that is so honest to be able to start generating work that then it becomes impossible to get out of. It's amazing what happens, right? This, this space is so wonderful to generate beautiful stories. And it feels that we're just starting in healthcare to get to that space and to craft that more and more. Like I said earlier, it's only in the past few years that there's been a substantial change. It feels that we were stuck in the 90s and in the 2000s for so long. You know, healthcare advertising has been repeating the same thing over and over until recently. And now we're trying to get to a place. And, and honestly, like what has happened today in, in the pandemic has been great for the motivation of healthcare advertising, for the understanding, the curiosity that people have and the knowledge that people have. So these are things that have helped us tremendously, right? The other thing that I wanna say about this space, especially when we talk about uh, understanding realities, this is one reality that is global. It's not a local reality. It's not a regional reality. It's a global reality. You see it with the pandemic, and that's one really easy example, right? But when you talk about any other thing that is healthcare related, related and that affects people, it is a completely unifying um, space. Uh, absolutely, right? So there's something to be say about that, you know? Uh, we're not different humans than in Africa or in Europe or in Australia. We are all living the same humanity. We are all having the same health concerns. Yeah, voice differently, you know, with different cultural influences that need to be taken into account, right? The meaning of a color in one country could not be a very different meaning in the color of, a, of another country, but the core of it remains the same. When we talk about emotion uh, and when we're telling a story, when we're telling a narrative, that narrative doesn't rely solely on the words that we're putting forward. We have one thing that is not regulated at all in healthcare, and that is the craft. 
the craft is something that adds a completely different layer of emotion to whatever we put it forward. And this is like a beautiful solution to a lot of things that we cannot say, but we can show. I love a lot of things that we can get into it where we can make feel. Music, camera work, casting, the choice of craft to be able to amplify the solutions that we're putting forward, super important, right? There's also something called the emotional flip. That emotional flip is really to capture your audience, make them believe something, flip it around and be extremely surprised about what happened at this moment. This is a, an ad, uh, I think it was made for Australia, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it was part, if I remember correctly, of that inaugural uh, pharmaceutical awards at the LA. Uh, I still remember this ad because I love the craft of it. I love the simplicity of it. And I love that emotional flip. I'm gonna let you guys watch it. And I would love to talk about it for a bit after with you guys, if you guys, want to chat about it because he, he found it very interesting and this really gets into the craft as well. I've seen this ad a thousand times and I get goosebumps every time. I don't know if that says something about my dysfunctionality or like how good this is, right? Or how by the simplicity, but honestly, I will play it again. I'm gonna play it one more time because I really want you guys to like look at the craft, look at the camera work, look at the zooms, look at the lighting, look, listen to the music and listen to the very short lines. I would love to hear from you guys your first thoughts of what this ad does. Even if you just write it in chat, if you don't wanna talk, it's just like a word of what is it that this does. If you guys could do that, it would be amazing. I know, trust me, I'm gonna take that and, and it's gonna help the rest of this presentation as well. So if you guys wanna take like maybe a minute and just to do that, if you guys don't mind. You know, the, honestly, the thing that I love about, about this is as a viewer, you are taking into this like very intimate moment where you're not supposed to be there. Right? It feels like you're sitting on a couch watching this happening. You get really sucked in into something. And the story is so simple, right? Completely unexpected. Of course, you expect that it's the father that is, has Parkinson because that's where we're all being accustomed to believe, right? That, it, it, and it's true, right? It hits a certain segment of the population that's a little bit older, but not always. 
And the not always part is the part that's really, really surprising and powerful, absolutely powerful. So I don't know if anyone had it, anything that they were able to add to the chat or not, but if not, we will continue. That's not a problem. Um, I have something to say. Oh yeah, please. Hi, Mati and Teresa. Hello. Um, I am, I don't know, I'm kind of an emotional person, so I'm kind of teary right now. Um, but what I really like about this ad is it kind of feels like watching a short clip in the middle of a movie. Like you just, I don't know, I felt like I really got to know the characters, even though it was under one minute, I guess. A bit crazy. It feels like, yeah, it feels like cinema, kind of. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that is the power of the craft, right? You could have told this story uh, with a different director, with a very different taste to it, a very different style, and you would have ended up in a very different place. If you pay attention, right? Like, let me uh, let me just to deconstruct this a little bit to like, how do we shape this like emotional narrative, right? In a healthcare um, type of, uh, in a healthcare conversation. You take the music, that piano, right? That elongates the moment, it's super essential. It's not a key that goes ping and that's, it stops. It's a key that the last, it just, takes you in with the camera to get to that moment, right? Everything that's happening, the storytelling is happening without words. The storytelling is happening by this interaction that is very true and very honest to what's happening within those two people. The touching of the hands, it's not something that's very like out there. It's not crazy. And shaking is a little bit more different, right? And whose hand is shaking becomes even more impactful at the end. So, you know, I'm seeing some messages that some of you were in tears. Um, I, 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 I could start crying right now every time I see this ad, right? So I'm trying like, to like hold back. I totally get how powerful this emotion is. And I'm actually loving the fact that some of you feel this type of emotion because that is what we do in healthcare advertising. That is where we want to get. That is where we want to make an impact and to be able to make a difference and to be able to disrupt. Without emotion, you cannot do that. And you cannot have the right emotion if you haven't listened and you haven't been relevant and you have not been the one to create that impact. It's an amazing space to be in. Um, the flip story telling is so surprising. It absolutely is, and it's extremely powerful. The switch, uh, defining the narrative of Parkinson's only affecting all the generations, absolutely in tears, emotionally impactful, re uh, reframe this type of person as Parkinson's effect. That's actually a very interesting comment, which is something that it's, it's a little bit of a, an advertising trick, right? Like that flip. It's always, it's always interesting, right? This misguidance that you have at the beginning of an ad and you flip it at the end. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. It's very interesting to do it when the craft helps you tell that story. And of course, the disease states helps you tell that story. It becomes a beautifully powerful way to narrate something. Um, I think the emotion here when he pulled his eyes away as if trying to find the words to say, beautifully said, absolutely. You, you notice how much attention we saw like, and, and how much subtlety goes into this to be able to tell the story. I feel like a moment that I could happen in my life. You feel like we had uh, peeped into a real people's life, absolutely. Because I can't take you enough, like for like really putting those comments in, because it, it, it's been absolutely in, incredible, right? To 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 feel those things. And so I guess I'm trying to get my screen here. Sorry. All right. So if I continue, right? Let's take that. Let's take that emotion that we have. And I want to talk a little bit about. The core always keeps us honest. What exactly does that mean? So if you think about how you cast people in an agency, as an example, you usually build a core team that really embraces a certain philosophy and 
they get along together, they believe, they have a common goal, right? They have a way to move forward. And then you add people, and there's two options. The people either attach themselves to the core or they bounce off. It's the same thing with an idea. Once you have your idea, that's going to be able to generate that narrative and that emotion, you have it and that is your core. That core becomes super important and it should always, always be the focal point and never be compromised. It will be compromised by regulations, by legal, by market research even, right? Which should not necessarily change the core, but it will change what's around it, right? When you believe in something that is right, it is right because it has checked so many boxes and it's, it's based on a truth that you wanna convey that you should never give up that core. Because there's gonna be a long road to get something approved, to get something done, to get something like where everyone is gonna agree. It's gonna be a long road. And that core is what keeps everyone focused and moving forward towards the same direction. And that as creative, we own it and we're responsible for it because we created it and we believe in it. And we have taken into account all the listening around us from clients, from patients, from behavior, from social realities, from regional realities to be able to put this forward. It's not because we felt like it. It's because we understood what needed to be said and because we believe that that understanding has led to this emotion that generates this narrative. What's going to change around it? Let it change, but do not lose your core in everything that you put forward. Conviction, it's what this is. I'm sure you guys have all felt it during your work at agencies, or even when you were studying in, um, in, in, in school, like in advertising school, design school, whatever it is, when you believe in something, you really go forward and you believe in it. And then it's a lot easier to make everyone understand what is it that you're putting forward, All right? So that's something that's super important to me. Um, the next slide is about, there is, there is a disruptive power in an emotional idea. And I think you guys saw that with this Parkinson ad, right? It wasn't only that it was emotional and that was it, Ab absolutely not. It was more about the emotion disrupted the conventional. The emotion came from a very surprising way in a very surprising moment in a very beautiful way. There's extreme, extreme power in that emotion. And when that emotion aligns well with something that's disrupt, you have something that's really golden. You have something that's really valuable and something that will last. That Parkinson ad, I wanna get back to it because I think it just it really depicts everything that I'm trying to put together here. Um, was done, I think it was like five years ago, if I'm not mistaken. Today is still relevant, right? Relevancy not only because it was it, it, the choices that were made, one, the core of the story will remain relevant for a long time. How that story is, spreads, is expressed, there were a lot of decisions in the craft that are not necessarily dated. The way the camera works, the lighting, so on and so forth, it's not dated. Right, So that's something to be careful about as well when we're crafting an idea. It's like, do we want longevity for it or do we want to date it to be impactful for right now and forget about it? Do you want it to evolve? Longevity on the emotion you will have, longevity on the craft you might lose. So that's something to always consider when you're putting ideas forward. It's going to be very, very important. Um, there's, uh, sorry, but I, there's uh, there's some messages on the on the chat that I can't see. So if there's anything that I need to know, please let me know. Uh, this is a slide that I really think it's gonna generate interest in discussion. September 24th, 2021. 
what's the alter narrative? That's today. If I were to put this slide in front of you guys with September 24, 20, let's say 2019, 2020, the narrative would have been very different. But we are living in a time where we have so much knowledge, uh, where we have so much curiosity, where we have so much ownership of what uh, health is and what the value of health is and how fragile that is for every single one of us and the people around us as well. There are anti-vaxxers, vaxxers, it's not even part of the discussion, honestly, because the reality is that our health is something that could just like go away, poof, like that. And we would be remiss if we wouldn't, as advertisers, if we wouldn't build on that reality and that truth that exists right now, in which the narration has changed and we have honestly haven't have done to do much. Media has done a lot of the work for us. Governments have done a lot of the work for us. So there's a momentum to be able to take that and to continue to expand on stories, on emotional stories, on narratives that are ownable, to be able to continue to be relevant and important in when it's good then. So I'll be curious, right? If I'm ever to give a talk like this in two years from now, when I change a date, what the narrative would be. So this is an evolving thing, right? And we need to pay attention of how that evolves, right? How behaviors are changing, not only people, but also governments and countries and cities. And there's a narrative in there that continues to evolve. And we need to be very attuned to all of it to be able to construct something that is absolutely relevant and concise. There's um, one more slide that I wanna show you guys. And I wanna, I, wanna, I really wanna take you guys back to the beginning of the presentation where I had an image of um, a woman that was in tears, right? We've been talking about healthcare this whole time. If you think about where that could fit in that space, it could be an ad about depression. It could be an ad about the loss of someone. It could be an oncology ad. It could be many, many things. So that own ability is for us to craft and to shape, to be able to do that narrative. But there's a flip on that, that little segment of the ad, the little clip of the ad that I show you. So I wanna show the whole one so you can see the importance of that flip and how we can shape what's in front of us to make it whatever we want as long as we remain relevant. I'll show it to you guys. <laughs> Can healthcare advertising be as emotional as hot sauce? Yeah, and even more relevant. I wanted to put this in front of you because this is some way of creating that flip right into something that becomes completely a part of the story that we're trying to get, right? It, it, it's only the Parkinson one, right? Where you, it just pull you in more and more and more and more, even with that flip. This one like flipped you to like a smile. It's like, ha, ah, okay, the reveal is funny, right? 
but I thought it was important to put it in front of you guys since the beginning of it really was a little bit just half of the story it wasn't the whole story. Half of the story is never enough to be able to get to that emotion. We need to get to completely close that loop to be able to get that payoff at the end, which is very important to do. So guys, this uh, you know has been incredible. I, I really wanna continue this chat with you guys. We can go back to any uh, slides that you guys wanna talk to. Uh, I think there's a couple of questions. So let's, uh, let's, let's just have a, a little chat now. Let's see how you guys feel about all of this and we'd love to talk to you guys a little more. Hey Marty, I'm going to start with bringing Teresa up. Sure. Um, cool. Um, there was something you said about um, like the longevity of an idea and dating and dating it. I, could you speak a bit more about that? I think I got a bit lost and I, I don't think I really understood. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, when you're when you're developing an idea, right? Longevity is super important, right? And a lot of the time, that longevity gets um, compromised when we get into the spaces that are a little bit too trendy, right? Easily put, you can take a great idea, make it last a year because the way you expressed it is so trendy that the next year it becomes a little bit more irrelevant. So that's what I mean by the longevity of it, right? A lot of that is in the craft as well, right? If uh, I were to do, um, let's say the, the, just to come back to the example of the Parkinson one, if I would have shot that a little bit more uh, specific to the trendy times of five years ago, you would have felt it already. So that kind of compromises the longevity, right? You need a good marriage between the craft, the expression, the trends, and what's happening in the universe at that time to be able to get to that core that's gonna have longevity and pertinence over several years as well. Does that clarify? Yeah, it does, it does, thank you. Okay, uh, hi, uh, I'm Aditi from McCann Hill, Dubai. Uh, we have, uh, I mean, um, the whole talk about uh, how the advertisements should be emotional and that really adds a lot to the day-to-day -day work. Uh, and the talk was really inspiring. Uh, I just have one question about uh, the healthcare advertising which is facing to the medical professionals. Now, when we talk to people, we have a very good platform to be emotional and to uh, talk about uh, what the person's feelings are. But somehow when we talk to uh, healthcare professionals, it becomes uh, very uh, scientific, very medical. So is there a way we can turn that around as well? So uh, thank you for that question, because you hit probably one of the biggest challenges, right, in, in, in healthcare advertising. Um, so how do you make science emotional, right? Like, how do you do that? And how do you get to physicians in a way that it's highly emotional for them as well? Well, the way that I see that is that physicians are as human as we are and as emotional as we are. The emotion that we put in front of a physician should never undermine the science. And sometimes you're not gonna be able to get away with the fact that you need to put something that's scientifically accurate and that's all they care about and that's what they're gonna be listening to. One of the things that has been happening in the past, this, in the past year is that there's no more of a lot of a face-to-face -face from reps with physicians anymore because of the pandemic, right? So some brands have gone from having 50 reps to having three reps, and now they're just doing everything online. That opens up a whole other type of opportunities to be able to inject emotion in little snippets, right? That could be highly emotional in the way that would say the science, right? To be able to communicate to the physician. Again, 
not an easy task because it's a big behavior that has to change, right? Physicians are very, well, and I would say physician, I don't want to overgeneralize because depending on their specialty, they all behave very different, right? An oncology sees things very differently than a GP as an example, right? So, but you cannot undermine the impact of something emotional in front of them because they're as human as anyone else. So if we're able to get to that surface and scratch it bit by bit, I have no doubt that the progress to something that's a lot more emotional to be able to convey science is going to be relevant. At the end of the day, the benefit of science is for people. It's not just for the people on the bench doing the work, right? There's an application to the science that goes all the way to the patient. The physician talks to a patient at one point, right? And in all honesty, there's no patients that wants to be taught pragmatically science, this is what's gonna to happen to you and that's it, right? That's okay. There's, there's a, a way to communicate to that patient that's more human and those physicians have it. The specialists have it, right? So they have that emotional login in them that we need to get to, to be able to emphasize that. It's gonna be happening bit by bit, I guarantee you. And it's a big battle, but it's one that you should never give up. Sure. Thank you so much. Marty, in the chat box, there were several um, young creatives who had thoughts on the Parkinson's ad, if you would like me to read those to you. Yes, please. Okay. The first one was from Victoria. It says, uh, I think that the Parkinson's ad pulls you out, pulls you in because it's a new moment. It feels like more of a unique moment. Then Aditi said, the flip in the storytelling here is so surprising. Chloe, the switch defying the narrative of Parkinson's only affecting older generations. Teresa, I was in tears. I thought it myself, I thought it was emotionally impactful. Hannah, reframes the type of person we assume Parkinson's affects. Um, that was Hannah Brady, Hannah Stokes. I think the emotion hit when he pulled his eyes away as if trying to find the words to say. Teresa said, it felt like a moment that could happen in my life. It felt like we had peeped into real people's lives here. And I felt that too. I was like, never would I think, you know, that it was gonna be the younger person who had Parkinson's. Uh, Shehan, unforgettable, reminded me of endangered syndrome by Canadian Down Syndrome Foundation and the story of Leo. Jasper, what made it so powerful for me is its simplicity and raw acting. They didn't have to overdo it and it was enough to create the impact. Those are incredible comments, honestly. The last one where you talk about raw acting, it's crucial, right? To be able to find those moments and people that are able like, to generate a certain uh, spark and tension that contributes to the storytelling without saying a word. And I think they did it beautifully in this case. Um, in all the comments, I think we can all definitely appreciate the value of an emotional narrative that exists in healthcare and the impact that it could have. I do understand and I acknowledge that that emotion is a lot more difficult to translate when we're talking to healthcare professionals in certain types of restricted areas. But like I said, it's one that we should all aspire to because the one common thing is the emotions and the humanity that we all have. And we've have felt that this past couple of past few months, I guess, past few months or so, of how uh, we have more commonalities and differences, uh, which is actually an, an, amazing, an amazing thing to say, right? Because it should be so obvious, but we don't live it. This is like a good way to reset that, you know, and to be able to push our work forward in a way that's going to be emotionally impactful. I think that I think we we we've seen through the last forty minutes or so that uh, it's extremely powerful to tell a story with a lot of emotion, emotion that doesn't come like I said before. It doesn't have to come on based on the words that we say. It has to come on how we say those words and how do we show that emotion and what does emotion sound like, right? And what are those pauses that are just as important as like the generation of words and rhythm. Rhythm, again, is an important way to be able to convey emotion as well. So absolutely, honestly, you, this, your comments have all been absolutely enriching and, and precious. 
Hi. Oh, I have a question. Yes. Yeah. Hi, I'm Christy. Um, I I think this is more like I guess I'm curious to know like what you think. I I don't know if there's like a right or wrong answer for this, but um, I'm curious to know like, I guess how do you um, like advise your clients like for example if they are trying to you know maybe touch on like a touchy subject for example you know even like vaccines or like the anti-vax and you know not you know and the people for vaccination or even like abortion and stuff like that like for topics like that where you kind of have really opinionated and divided sides um how would you approach it and like um do you have to pick a side or do you kind of you know use a general safe tone in like the creatives that go out or what kind of chat, you know, kind of goes on behind the scenes with the clients? Great, Great. Uh, question. I'll, um, I'll take the, uh, the vax versus non-vaxxers part of your questions because the abortion one, it's more like a political, social type of discussion that I don't think clients will necessarily have an opinion on. The vax, anti-vax conversation um, that's the one that it's it's easy. It's an easy answer. I'll tell you. I'll tell you why. When you approach a client or a client approaches you, and this client does vaccines, right? That is their main focus. How do we push vaccines? The um, our advice to this client, based on of course research on behavior that we do, is like where are the anti-vaxxers, what are the pro-vaxxers, and there's those in between those two that exist. We need to commit because you can't solve it all. Clients need to commit to be able to solve a problem. You need to commit. You go this way. The same we commit to an idea, and we go with this idea. The client has to commit to a strategy and work with the strategy. So there's a lot of discussion that happens before we come with, a, uh, with, with an advice, right? So as an example, the VAX one, it's, it's a very relevant one. Um, we, what we had suggested to, to clients, and this is true for all like companies that are pushing uh, vaccines, is to ignore the anti-vaxxers. Sometimes uh, it takes a lot more work with less results to convince the unconvincibles. But then you have the not yet convinced that is the type of people that are open to hearing and to discussion. And then you have the Provax, which you already have. So these, these recommendations are, are always based on the research, right? We go into research or behavior that's being done. We, we work very closely with the strategies. And that could be part of the problem, right? That the client puts in front of you. It's like, who do I talk to? And how do I talk to them? And why should I talk to them? So those are all questions that the agency takes in, uh, brings in a strategist, behavior scientists, so on and so forth, to be able to really map out who is it that we're going to talk to, and then shape a strategy around it, and then put it in front of the client, have them commit to it, not have commit. Well, what about them? No, you commit to that. You commit to one, and you put all your energy into it, and then we're able to have good results. Yeah, no, yeah, th thanks for that. I think maybe, yeah, I guess my question kind of stemmed from when um, I know you said, you know, in healthcare, it's like, um, like if you breathe, like you are our target audience. So I kind of started thinking of like, you know, we can't possibly reach like everyone, you know, all the time. Like obviously there are target audiences and stuff like that. But I guess, you know, um, I was curious into like the client's minds, like how much do they, how much do they invest in like trying to convince people to go to a certain side in that sense? Um, yeah. So, you know, I think uh, clients in healthcare, for the most part, a lot of the things is, is awareness towards a decision that benefits their product, right? So you start with that awareness, which is a little bit more of a soft way of getting in. Parkinson ad, as an example, is an awareness, right? It's an awareness ad to put awareness about Parkinson. And then the next step is to be actionable, right? you need to create awareness that leads to action versus just like pushing a product necessarily. In some circumstances, you're going to be pushing a product, right? And the product is going to be pushed into segments that are more interesting than, than others. So that, again, based on research, see which segment it's going to be more interesting. How are you going to be talking to them? Where are you going to place your media? How are you going to be relevant to them? And so on and so forth. When I said that if you breathe, you are the target, that is the amplitude and the, uh, the reach that healthcare advertising has, right? The reach is huge. The reach is global. The reach are humans, right? All over the place, right? Um, and that makes um, healthcare very 
relatable for every single one of us and important as well. That's what I meant by that, uh, by that notion as well. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Hi, it's me, Teresa again. Uh, I have a question, I guess it's kind of related to that. Uh, you started off by saying um, that, or you, you asked if painkillers could be as emotional as hot sauce. And I, I'm a big fan of the Parkinson ad, but it's not necessarily um, a medical ad. It's more like an awareness campaign, I guess. Like, I guess my question is how would you reassemble this, this kind of like emotional advertisement for a client who wants to see something that puts their product more in a like, like they want to see the solution or like what is their um, product impact? They don't want to show the problems. They don't want to show big people. They want to show, um, 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 you know, happy, yeah. healthy, lovely people at the beach. And I guess it's not just um, connected to healthcare because I don't work in healthcare. I uh, work a lot for telecommunications, I guess, but it's the same kind of core problem. Yeah. Like how do we bring this kind of like big emotion into yeah. something? Um, yeah, I think, I think you got the question. Yeah, let me let me try to answer that because uh, it's uh, it's a very valid and, and interesting point as well. So, Parkinson, the Parkinson ad is is an awareness. Agree, one hundred percent. It's not pushing a product or a solution, right? It's driving towards an awareness campaign that leads to a solution. So it seems a little bit far removed. If I go back to the painkiller hot sauce thing. If you have a little pill that's a painkiller, how do you inject emotion into that? And is that pushing the product, compromising the emotion, right? This is like, this is what I'm reading in your question. And, and, and let me talk it through and then you'll, we'll probably adjust. Now, there's, there's several things that need to be considered. First of all, if you take the painkiller as an example, as a product push, you need to look at the category, meaning like who else is talking about painkillers and how are they talking about painkillers? What is the narrative that exists in that category? If everyone is talking about the solution, right, then you might be able to find white space to talk about the problem. If everyone is talking about the solution with happy people running on the beach, Maybe you want to talk about the solution in a very different tone. So emotion becomes relevant, right, in association with the product, especially when you put solution forward that leads immediately to the product. When you're talking about a product, you can't make a story that is takes you in and out and up and down, right, and never gets to the product. You need to be able to get to the solution first, highly emotional solution, by this product, right? It's a bit of a construct that's a little bit different than the Parkinson one, but it could be just as impactful as well, right? So all that to say that it's not because you're putting a product forward that emotion needs to be compromised, it's quite the opposite, but you need to really pay attention on what else is being done so you don't become invisible. And that is one of the biggest challenges, right, in healthcare, that everyone seems to gra gravitate towards one tonality all the time. And that's where you become a little bit more invisible. If you, if you pay attention to the uh, TV spots, most of them from the, from the U.S., because they're, they're long, like 60-second spots, a lot of them, if, if, you, if you look at them in, in mute without any sound, it's very hard to tell what is for what and what is the space that they're owning because regulation is driving them that way. They're all people like doing some types of activity that don't have a high impact and some type of emotion in which emotions are grandfather with kid, you know, mother and kid, a baby, people hugging, you know, that's the conventional emotion. So this is where you got to start challenging yourself, right? If that space exists and how is how that is how emotion is defined for a product and for a lot of products and for a lot of categories, what is that space where I can put my wedge in and generate something that's completely different? Yeah, thanks. That, that actually helps a lot. Um, I guess I was wondering, but how do you approach um, a client with that kind of idea? Because of course, they yeah. look at, as, at the market as well, and they see like all yeah. those companies that um, they see as their, uh, um, yeah. they see uh, them all doing the same thing. So it must be the right thing. 
Exactly. <laughs> how do you uh, push a more like, uh, yeah. how do you push a different idea to them? So that is the best part of the job, right? To be the person at the table that they look at you and they all think you're completely nuts, right? Because this is not going to work. This has never been done. This is not what we do. Nobody's doing this this way. But that's where uh, market testing and research comes in very handy, very, very handy. So the usually the way that uh, we approach clients for concepts, we sh let's say if we show three concepts, right? And we do them in the form of a concept board in which you have uh, a visual with a headline, no more than that, or it could be a script or whatever you want, but something that's a little bit top line. We say, listen, this is something that's a little bit more conventional or what's out there, but we give it this little twist. This is something that uh, pushes this boundary a little bit more. And this is something that is going to get everyone in this room completely uncomfortable. And then the discussion become, be, uh, starts to become very interesting because we're trying to convince the client that this spot, this advertisement is not talking to them. It's talking to somebody else who doesn't work in this industry, who has not been part of all the restrictions that exist right now. So you need to listen to who's out there. So we go do that listening and we do market research and then we test those boards, right? And you don't want to go into testing with like a variation of the same thing. You want to push, you want to push and you want to push. And more often than not, right? The biggest push is usually what tests the best in front of uh, people in market research. Then you have your proof points, your data, which clients love and they can relate to and then you go back and you put that forward and this is why. Then to be able to push that idea, you need something that is not always existent and is a very brave client. And once you have that, then you're able to push those ideas, right? And of course, this is again, when I talk about the stamina and being true to that core, you're still gonna go through medical, you're still gonna go to regulatory and they're all gonna question and they're all gonna say no and they're all gonna do this and you're gonna be able to, if you're already bought in, with the client and the client has become your partner and a true believer in what you're doing and their bravery is with you, they will help you through all of that and it will happen. So that's kind of like how we approach it in a nutshell with a lot of notes. <laughs> I get it, I get it. Okay, thank you a lot. You're welcome.